Today I'm going to begin with something that's totally unrelated to anything. It's just a fun fact, and I'm just curious if you know. Does anyone know what is uh, the most sung song on the planet in English? Happy birthday, okay? That means that uh, probably, uh, how many Americans are there? Is it uh, 230 million? Something like that? I think it is. Uh, hear it every year, probably, unless you're Jehovah's Witness, you don't. And um, uh, we sing it probably to all of our brothers and sisters, our parents, our grandparents, our friends. It, it's, it's the most sung song there is. And, um, and it's such a simple little ditty. It only uh, includes six words. Happy birthday to you, dear whoever. Perry, I'll say. Six words. And it just keeps repeating. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Mary. Happy birthday to you. And we all know it and we all sing it. Now, I mention it only for this reason. It, it was written, I think, in 1868 by Patty and Mildred Hill. Um, I don't know why they came up with it. I didn't get into that much with uh, Siri. I just did the basics, okay? But imagine writing a ditty of six words that becomes the most known song on the planet. And 150 years and some years later, we're still doing it, just as written. It proves, I believe, how something very simple that you say or do can have an enormous impact. How many of us could say, I remember in second grade, my teacher once said this. And we remember it all the way back 60, 70 years. So I would ask you, what have you said? Or what have you done that has had that kind of an impact on somebody else? And do you believe that your words and actions can, both negatively and positively? It's fact. It's fact. We should take great care, be very mindful uh, when we speak and for what we do or fail to do because it is very impacting. Now, today in these scriptures, uh, clearly the theme is about praying and praying incessantly. And we will get some answers as to why that's important. But first of all, in that second reading, we have a beautiful reflection about the power of the scriptures, the power of the scriptures to teach, to form our ways of following the Christ for correcting us, and that it's inspired by God. So having said that and believing that as a context for these two readings, let me go to the first reading, and it's a, it's a story about prayer, a brief a historical story that Amalek uh, waged war on Israel. Everybody waged on war on Israel at some point in time. So Amalek is there uh, fighting. So Moses, taking his shepherding staff and his staff of authority, goes up on the hill, and he instructs Joshua, the, the leader of the army. He says, well, I will pray for you, and when I'm doing this, God will protect us. So he goes up there, and as long as he lifted up his hands in prayer, they were victorious. And the moment he put them down, they were losing. Yay! Ooh! Yay! Ooh! So they had to prop his arms up. Now, this is the only part of the story that, that uh, gets me uh, in, a, in a weird way because uh, it, it's, it's one of those little mechanical things. However, perhaps it points to the value of posture. You know, um, on Good Friday, and in fact, as a, as a kid, I loved serving because we also got to take our shoes off. Uh, on Good Friday, you removed your shoes with the priest and the deacon and everybody else in the sanctuary, and then you marched in and you uh, lay down on the floor, which I still do. I don't take my shoes off, but I got sandals, so it doesn't matter anyway. But I lay down, face flo on the floor, and all my ministers and those who are reading the Passion are on the floor face down. And you might say, well, why? What, what is that about? Well, we do the same thing when we get ordained to priesthood and diaconate because it's a very important posture of defenselessness and total surrender. You see, if I were on my back and you came to attack me, I have my legs to kick you, my hands to hit you, but I could spit on you, call you names. But if I don't even see you coming, because I'm flat on my face on the ground and you come and attack from the back, I'm a goner. I'm surrendering my whole self to you. 
So that's what we do before God on Good Friday, before the cross. We surrender ourselves, all of our spirit. It's a beautiful posture. And I don't know if people catch that, but I know it fills me with great meaning always on that day. So to lift up our arms in prayer, to raise our hands to the heavens, to God, it's, it's, a, it's a posture, a gesture that maybe opens our spirit more, makes our prayer more focused on God. I know as a priest, again, at the altar, I get a different perspective than you, but I'd say 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, it began to become very traditional for people to join hands during the Our Father. Some priests were really opposed. Hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. But, but I always saw it as very beautiful from the altar. And then in, in some of the churches, well, I was in, in a black and Latino church in, in uh, Los Angeles, South Los Angeles, and they even would ho- join hands and they'd rock as they'd sing the Our Father. And, and it was, the whole church is moving back and forth. And it was very visually appetizing, just beautiful. But then the cardinal came in. He wrote this beautiful letter on worship, and the, especially the Eucharist. And he suggested many things. One of them was, for example, for communion, instead of coming from the first row, because that used to be the tradition, the ushers would come up and stand behind the first row and usher the people to come to communion, then the second row all the way back. He said, no, start from the back. Lead the people down during the song, the Lamb of God. It's a procession song as the bread is being broken and prepared to be shared, and from the last row as they come forward, and why he said, because it's very biblical, the last will be first and the first shall be last. And it was about a spirituality of even how we celebrate the Eucharist. I thought it was very lovely. And then he said, you know, that it's a tradition for many people now to hold hands, and he said, I would propose to you that perhaps a better gesture would be to raise your hands, he called it in the orans position. It's a Latin word, in the praying position, in the Moses position, in the lifting up their hands, and as long as your hands were raised in prayer and your voice was raised in prayer, God was so present to you and could work wonders through you. Maybe that's what Patty and Mildred did, you know. God, we want to do an inspirational song. I don't know. So... I stand here as I pray it and watch this. It's, it's, to me, it's the most participatory moment in the Mass, always. In fact, the reason when people say, can we sing it, I say, I'd rather not. Because if you sing it, a lot of people don't participate in it. But it's the one prayer that everybody seems to know. Even little kids learn it. And they're all into that prayer. And what a beautiful way to be with our hands upstretched to heaven and to God, praising our God and asking God uh, to be with us and give us our daily bread and teach us forgiveness. And wow, lead us to your kingdom, God. Lead us to your kingdom. So that first reading, Moses is persistent. And even when tired, he gets his brothers to help him to hold but he keeps persistent in prayer. And that's the very thing that Jesus speaks about. And he does it through the, a parable, a little story. And, um, and the point is so clear, be persistent in prayer. That's an expression of your faith. You believe that God is hearing you and God loves you and will be there for you. Trust that, believe that, and be persistent. So he tells this parable, this little story, and it's kind of obnoxiously wonderful Here's this, and these details are important, a widow. Now, ladies, I'm so sorry, but, you know, you have a much better place in society. Now, you can vote. Before my lifetime, was in the 20s, the women got the right to vote. Finally, you can inherit money and property. Um, But in times of Jesus, women couldn't inherit. They certainly couldn't vote. They couldn't even speak. They couldn't even speak in public without their man. I mean, that was just the way it was. Women couldn't uh, speak in court and defend anybody because their words were useless, worthless. They were more like possessions, almost could be bought and sold. And I'm not sure of this, and somebody can uh, uh, correct me later, but I think the concept of the dowry, that the father sells his daughter to the man that's going to marry her, how gross is that? Here, I'll give you $1,000. Marry my daughter. How gross is that? Ladies, you should have punched somebody out over that, I think. 
So here we have a widow. Now, it doesn't say whether she uh, has any children, but even if she did, her son would inherit, not her. And it would depend on his kindness to his mother if she were able to stay in the house with him. So she had no rights, no voice, nada, nada. But people were mistreating her, and she had an adversary, and she wanted not revenge, she wanted justice. She wanted what was rightfully hers. So she goes to the judge. Now, the judge clearly, and I'm not making this up, although there are probably at least one judge in the world who's corrupt, I don't know, uh, who could be bought. I, say, I guess they say most anybody can be bought by a, some price, and depending on how desperate they are for something. But the scripture says twice. Jesus says at first he was a corrupt judge. He had no fear of God, and he couldn't care less about man. And, and even he says it later. The judge himself says, I have no fear of God, and I don't care about human beings. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor this woman and, and rule in her uh, favor. Why? Because she won't shut up. She won't leave me alone. She keeps coming back, and he says, I'm even afraid one day she's going to come up and strike me. Now, that's a persistent woman. That woman ain't given up. She ain't given up. And so he finally rules in her favor, and he says, that's how you should pray. <laughs> that's his example. Pray like her. Be persistent. Keep coming back to God. Now, I think the reason is to let God into our stuff. The problem, I think, that I hear from people why sometimes they get discouraged in prayer is they don't get the first thing they ask for. They are perhaps people who put all their eggs in one basket. That's always a dangerous thing. Father Tim McGowan, who used to be here, always said, you know, no, you always have another egg that you save so you can throw it. <laughs> but, but, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. If anything happens to the basket, you, you lose them all. Or, to put it another way, do you have a plan B? What about a plan C? Because if your plan A doesn't work, then it's all shot. You better have a plan B as a backup, and then even a plan C, and maybe even a D. So if A doesn't work, you move on down the line. But some people, I hear, pray as if they can only have plan A. God, it has to be plan A. God, help me. God, why aren't you hearing me? God, what have I done to you? Why have you abandoned me, Lord? I'm asking for plan A. But some people pray persistently and strongly, with tears even, and they come to the realization, no, plan A is not going to be there for me. I think especially when somebody doesn't get a job that they want, or they have that job and then they get fired or they lose it, or it gets, uh, you know, the job isn't needed anymore, and they want that job. And they pray for it and everything. And then suddenly, out of the back door, comes an offer to be, I don't know, a trash collector? I don't want to be a trash collector. How gross is that? But they get this job, and they say, well, it has good benefits. The hours are okay. It's, not, uh, it's work, but it's not a killer job. And then they begin to realize, you know, I'm keeping the city clean. There are fewer rats on this block because we're cleaning up the trash. Pretty proud of that. Pretty proud of that. And plan B becomes something that fulfills them, makes them feel good at what they're contributing. So Jesus today, he's challenging us to be persons and a people of prayer. You know, for the last couple months, I've been praying at almost every single Mass for Ukraine, for peace in Ukraine. I don't know if my prayers are doing anything. They keep convincing me of the need for peace. But I hear other people say, Lord, hear our prayer. And if they are attentive, if they listened and actually heard that prayer for peace, maybe they are being convinced more to live lives of peace and to make peace a reality. We just had horrible news in the last week or so, um, over three council people um, being racist. And, and um, it's ugly. And what a hoopla over this. Oh, my God. But, but does it not rip the scab off of our 
our body, our social body here in Los Angeles. We can remember things like Rodney King. If you're black, you know what kind of racism is out there. Latinos too. Filipinos, in the last couple of years, the Asians are really getting it. There was a beautiful document put out by the bishops of this country on racism, and actually, we're a pilot parish for it. We're one of several that was chosen, and um, I, I think I know some reasons. So a little group of us and staff uh, sat down with some of the people that were involved in the for formulating a, um, a direction for us to take as a church in Los Angeles. And I say, we as spiritual people, we have a responsibility and a call from God himself, I am sure, to eradicate racism, for us to be able to say to each other and to the whole world, everybody's equal in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, brown, green. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we're all human beings. We're all in this together. And what a gift. If the largest archdiocese, I believe we are in the United States, the capital of, of communications, uh, where most of the movie industries thrive here, uh, one of the richest places in the land, just, just, just there's so much, one of the most culturally diverse places, it's the place where most countries in the world, their second largest population outside of their capital and their country is Los Angeles. In fact, it was about 10 years ago that I heard on the radio that they said it used to be in terms of population numbers that it was Mexico City, Guadalajara, Los Angeles. Now it's Mexico City, Los Angeles, and Guadalajara. And if that's still true, wow. Wow. So don't we have a voice? Don't we have a responsibility to speak up and speak out against racist ways of thinking and holding people down because of the color of their skin, for God's sake? It's one of my favorite things about Los Angeles, all of the cultural diversity. They say there are 80 languages that Mass has said every weekend here in this, this archdiocese. Wow, what a gift. What a gift. And so... Jesus says, hmm, will you pray like this woman? Be insistent. Be persistent. Don't stop. Don't let it go. But then, most provocative of all, after, all of, after he states this need for us to be persistent prayers and to go after it like, like a dog with a bone, just do not let go of it. And he says, hmm, but when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith here? Will he? I wonder. Will he find faith here? And only we can answer that question.